The Earls of Northumberland, members of the Percy family for a long period were a power in the north of England. Their pedigree has been traced back to Mainfred, a Danish chieftain who rendered great service to Rollo in the conquest of Normandy. William de Percy landed on the English shore with Duke William, and for valor at the Battle of Hastings, he was rewarded with extensive grants of land in Yorkshire. In their northern strongholds, this noble family lived in stately style and frequently figured on the battlefield and took their share in events which make up the history of the country. The story of their lives, with its lights and shades, reads like a romance. But it is outside our purpose to linger over its romantic episodes. It may be stated that the fourth Earl was Lord Lieutenant of Yorkshire and by direction of King Henry VII, he had to make known to the inhabitants of his county the reasons for a most objectionable tax for the purpose of engaging in a war with Britannia. This gave rise to a bitter feeling against him, the people erroneously believing that the tax was levied at his instigation. In 1489, a mob broke into his house at Cockledge near Thirsk, murdering him and several of his servants. The Earl had been a generous man and was much beloved, and his untimely death was deeply deplored. He was buried in Beverly Minster, and 14,000 people attended his funeral. His son, the fifth Earl, who was born at Leconfield Castle in the year 1457, was a man of aesthetic tastes and a patron of learning. He is described as being vain and excessively fond of pomp and display. When the Princess Margaret journeyed to Scotland to marry the King, the Earl escorted her through Yorkshire. According to an old account, he was well horsed upon a fair courser with a cloth to the ground of crimson velvet, his arms very rich in many places upon his saddle and harness, and his stirrups gilt. With him were many noble knights, all arrayed in his livery of velvet with some goldsmith's work, great chains, and were well mounted. The Earl had three castles and lived at them alternately. And as he had only sufficient furniture for one, it was removed from one house to the other when he changed residences. Seventeen carts and one wagon were employed to convey it. In the year 1512, he commenced the compilation of what we now call the Northumberland Household Book, and it contains regulations and other details respecting his castles at Wrestle and Leconfield. From this curious work, we obtain an interesting picture of the home life of a nobleman in Tudor times. We find that the Earl lived in state and splendour, little inferior to that of the King. The household was conducted on the same plan as that of the reigning monarch, and the warrants were made out in the same form and style. As the King had his Privy Council and Great Council of Parliament to assist him in enacting statutes and regulations for the public weal, so the Earl of Northumberland had his council, composed of his principal officers, by whose advice and assistance he established this code of economic laws. As the king had his lords and grooms of the bedchamber who waited in their respective turns, so the Earl of Northumberland was attended by the constables and bailiffs of his several castles who entered into waiting in regular succession. We further find that all the leading officers of his household were men of gentle birth and consisted of controller, clerk of the kitchen, chamberlain, treasurer, secretary, clerk of the signet, surveyor, heralds, ushers, almoner, a schoolmaster for teaching grammar, minstrels, eleven priests, presided over by a doctor of divinity or dean of the chapel, and a band of choristers, composed of eleven singing men and six singing boys. The head officials sat at a table called the Knights Board. Every day were expected to sit down to dinner, 166 officers and domestic servants, and 57 visitors. The amount annually spent in housekeeping was, in our money, about £50,000. The number of daily meals was four, and consisted of breakfast taken at seven, dinner at ten, supper at four o'clock, and livery served in the bedroom between eight and nine before retiring to rest. The Lord sat at the head of the table in state. The oaken table, long and clumsy, stood in the great hall, and the guests were ranged according to their station on long, hard, and comfortless benches. The massive family silver salt cellar was placed in the middle of the table and persons of rank sat above it and those of an inferior position below it. There was a great display of pewter dishes and wooden cups and plenty of food and liquor was on the table, but elegance did not prevail. Forks had not been introduced and fingers were used to convey food to the mouth. The allowances at the meals were most liberal. 
one perceives there was much wine and beer consumed in those days. Take, for example, that at breakfast. On meat days it included, For me lord and lady a loaf of bread on trenchers, two manchets, a quart of wine, half a chin of mutton, or a chin of beef boiled. The fare of the two elder children, my lord Percy and Mr. Thomas Percy, consisted of half a loaf of household bread, two quarts of beer, a chicken, or else three mutton bones boiled. It will be noticed that wine was not served to the two young noblemen. The breakfast on fish days was as follows. For my lord and my lady, a loaf of bread on trenchers, two manchets, a quart of beer, a quart of wine, two pieces of salt fish, six baked herrings or a dish of sprats. For the two elder sons, half a loaf of household bread, a manchet, a pottle of beer, a dish of butter, a piece of salt fish, a dish of sprats, or three white fresh herrings. For the two children in the nursery, a manchet, a quart of beer, a dish of butter, a piece of salt fish, a dish of sprats, or three white herrings. And for my lady's gentlewoman, a loaf of bread, a pottle of beer, a piece of salt fish, or three white herrings. It will be observed that the family dined two to a plate, this being the usual practice in the Middle Ages. The other meals were quite, if not more substantial than that of breakfast. The liveries, as we have previously stated, were consumed in the bedchamber just before retiring to rest, and the Earl and Countess had placed on their table two manchettes, a loaf of household bread, a gallon of beer, and a quart of wine. The wine was warmed and mixed with spices. After reading the preceding bills of fare, we are not surprised to learn that at this period, the English people were regarded as the greatest eaters in Europe. <laughs>